Good morning, folks. Um, hi, my name is uh, Pooja Khumri. Uh, I work as a software engineer at Platform 9 Systems. And today I'm going to talk about uh, how do you deploy virtual network functions with Kubernetes, parts, and VMs. So the agenda of this uh, session is to cover the following items. Uh, firstly, I'll talk about uh, virtual network functions in general, like or what it really means and what are the advantages of running uh, virtual network functions and what kind of uh, application performance enhancements we can do use uh, the two technologies here, uh, one being SRIOV. And after that, we'll talk about OBS TPDK. For each of these technologies, I'll talk about um, at a high level what it really means. Uh, how do you really deploy it on a Kubernetes cluster in terms of any kind of configuration that needs to be done on the host. And once that is done, uh, how do you actually deploy a VNF application using the KubeFort virtual machine platform here? And I'll do a quick demo after that, demonstrating uh, VNF applications or other VMs and uh, pods that can be created using SRIOV and TPDK networks. So let's get right into it. Uh, so firstly, uh, what's a virtual network function, right? So uh, network functions are basically all the networking capabilities that you typically expect from, uh, expect to run on hardware uh, that's dedicated for um, running such kind of uh, applications and uh, virtual network functions is a new way of kind of doing it uh, on the word using the virtualization layer, and there are several advantages to it that we'll talk about next. Um, before we get into that, uh, we hear these terms NFVs and VNFs a lot. So I just wanted to first uh, kind of give an introduction to what's a network function virtualization or NFV in short, and, and then move on to VNFs. Uh, so NFV is basically the architectural concept where it allows you to abstract away. Uh, network functions from the physical hardware. Uh, like I mentioned in the past, uh, a few years back, you would have um, dedicated uh, hardware that's very specialized and capable of running these network functions like routing and firewall and security, right? Um, all of those applications. And um, the new way of doing it is using virtual uh, software-based uh, applications. Uh, so NFV is more of the uh, entire architecture paradigm and in terms of the three basic components of that, uh, these are the three framework level components. First being the actual application, which is your virtualized network functions. Uh, so that's VNFs. Uh, secondly, uh, for running these applications, you need a infrastructure to run it on. Uh, so that's the NFV infrastructure or NFVI. And uh, lastly, the management automation and network uh, orchestration layer which is basically um, abbreviated as MANO here. And uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about all of them, right? So uh, with the telco cloud, uh, the, this is like the new uh, way of doing it without having uh, dedicated hardware for each network function. And uh, the primary goal is to improve uh, agility and scalability for, for different telco service providers, right? For uh, being able to add new applications on demand and that shouldn't require uh, additional hardware resources. Uh, so if we talk about VNFs, uh, these are the software applications that would deliver functions such as um, file sharing, directory services, routing, uh, uh, firewall um, mechanisms and all of that, right? So there could be different applications that you can run as VNFs. And this could run either in a virtual machine or a Kubernetes pod. Uh, the next thing uh, in terms of the infrastructure, uh, the NFVI components, uh, the three basic ones would be compute, storage, and networking. And in terms of uh, the hypervisor, it could either be running on KVM or VMware, uh, any of those, or, or a container management platform like uh, Kubernetes with QFort. So apart from running these uh, network apps, you also need a framework that's capable of managing the NFV infrastructure itself. 
and secondly also handle the life cycle of these new vnfs that are getting deployed so that's the third component uh, the management automation and network orchestration there uh now we spoke briefly about what vnfs are and uh, primarily uh, they they are the applications that run on top of this nf infrastructure like i said and mostly they are going to be deployed as virtual machines and that's the vnf part of it and corresponding to that there's also a cnf technology which basically runs it on containers um the common vnf applications that i spoke about uh, these are just some examples uh, that you can run uh, and the goal here is to not run it as one monolithic vm right so the way it kind of does it is by doing a service chaining in the sense that you can have different functions run as part of independent network functions and you can kind of put them together as building blocks in a process and the service chaining is the entire um, of the entire uh, network function components is something that you can simplify using vnf technology uh, so what are the benefits of using vnfs uh, so network functions have always been there right and uh, with proprietary hardware you you could get a good performance out of uh, these applications the the problem there was that it, it kind of becomes monolithic at a certain point and scaling individual components is a problem so with virtual network functions you get improved network scalability because each of the network function is running on its own vm has its own resources and you can enable it disable it or manage it as needed independent of any other components in that service chain secondly because you are able to run it as vms for example you can pack more number of vms on a given hypervisor in that case and with that density of vms you get an efficient use out of your whole infrastructure right so it's it's getting utilized to its maximum potential with that uh, the other advantage of doing that is because you are relying on maybe lesser commodity hardware because you're uh running it with either containers or vms uh, the power utilization of your data center goes down drastically so that that's another side benefit of it uh you can also implement better security policies uh with vns because we have more fine grain control over each of the functions uh obviously this saves on any physical space in your data center that you would have otherwise needed if you had like a uh hardware setup right any hardware appliances for each of your functions uh, apart from all of that uh, in terms of uh, operational and capital expenses for a uh, running a data center with a telco cloud uh, you can get significant savings with running it as a virtual network function uh, so so these are some of the um, benefits that you you would achieve with a vnf deployment and in terms of optimizing the performance of the vnf applications itself uh, the primary goal here is uh, how do you get uh, heavy network traffic uh, optimized for vnf applications when you have multiple vms running on a hypervisor in your cloud since in a nfv environment there are going to be multiple individual vnfs that are joined together and you're trying to create a single kind of a super meta service out of it uh you are looking at the efficient memory access and resource allocation over for an aggregated system right and uh, when you are dealing with a high amount of uh, network traffic uh what you would the performance that you would achieve with a native linux kernel stack that's that's not going to suffice in this case because uh the number more the number of vnfs that you pack on a single host it's going to drive up the aggregate usage to a very high level that cannot be uh, met by standard linux stack so the uh, srlv and dpdk are two kind of solutions uh, that can be used either independently of each other or in a combination and uh, that helps you achieve like faster packet processing that's needed by these vnf applications so first let's talk about uh, srlv so uh, that stands for single root io virtualization and 
with SLIV, the benefit that you get is you can have dedicated PCI devices for each of your virtual machines. And uh, the, the advantage that you get out of that is because you're creating multiple virtual functions outside of a, uh, out of a single PCI device, you can allocate them to independent VNFs and not have any overlap between them. So this kind of gives you a good isolation of the resources and, and it's better for performance as well as security reasons. And it's also easier to manage because you can um, basically deploy one VNF independent of the other and add or remove SRIV networks to it as required. The performance benefit that SRIV gains, it, it comes from the basic fact that in this case, it's by the network traffic is bypassing your hypervisor and without getting any kernel interrupts uh, for any data, data that comes in or out of the VM, you are able to access the NIC directly. And that, that's primarily how it, it's able to give you faster packet switching. To actually run SRIV on a host, you need support in the BIOS level as well as at the operating system level. So, so those are kind of the two, two requirements for running it. And uh, in terms of uh, how it's presented to a VM, uh, it doesn't really make a difference to the VM because it's, it's on the host level that you are kind of slicing a PCI device into multiple virtual functions. But from the guest point of view, it's only gonna see it as a NIC card. So the application running inside it does not really change, change a whole lot. Uh, in terms of uh, the terminology used here, um, the physical functions are basically your full featured PCI functions. And when I say full featured, it basically means it, it comes with its own set of uh, configurations, right? You can configure the PCI device and each individual PF. Um, when you slice it into multiple virtual functions, these are lightweight PCI functions in the sense that you don't have uh, the same configuration capabilities that you would get with the PFs. So they're kind of uniform in terms of the device type that, that would match the physical function that you have. So this is just a pictorial view to kind of uh, explain how SRIV really helps you bypass the hypervisor. Uh, in this case, uh, for instance, if you had uh, a VM utilizing the OVS bridge, uh, that's the open vSwitch bridge uh, on the hypervisor, um, without SRIV, any data packets that come in or out of the VM, uh, that would create a kernel interrupt. And when it processes that, there's obviously a switching over it that happens. And uh, that slows down the network performance, uh, network throughput, right? So with SRIV, because you are giving each virtual function direct access to the NIC, um, the network throughput increases significantly. And that's how your VNFs can benefit from that. Uh, now, uh, when we talk about uh, deploying VNF apps on the uh, virtualization platform, uh, the solution that we are looking at here is KubeWord, which is a virtual machine framework uh, that runs on top of Kubernetes. Uh, with KubeWord, there is inbuilt support for SRIOV. Uh, you just need to enable a feature flag for uh, enabling that. And once that is done in terms of actually being able to use SRIOV, there are certain plugins that you also need on your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the first one of them is the SRIOV device plugin. Uh, SRIV device plugin is the one that's responsible for uh, kind of detecting and uh, discovering the any SRIV resources that are available on a host. Uh, once it detects that, it also advertises them to Kubernetes and the resource Kubernetes resource manager will then allocate them as it's requested by any ports and VMs. Uh, so this is a, a read only kind of service in the sense that uh, it won't modify anything on the host in actual actuality. And the only thing that it does is basically advertises these resources and updates the uh, capacity section of each cluster node so that that can be used by the Kubernetes scheduler when uh, allocating resources to VMs. Uh, 
uh, for uh, any virtual machines that you run uh, on Qput, uh, it allocates a VFIO device uh, for each of those parts. And this is the only driver that, that is supported today with Qput. Uh, secondly, there's the SRIV CNI plugin. Uh, so this is the plugin that's responsible for actually uh, configuring whatever SRIV resources allocated to a specific VM. And in terms of configuring, it will kind of modify the host resources to prepare them to be used for a virtual machine instance. So, so this, is, uh, this is not a read-only plugin in that sense. And what, whatever commands it runs, it basically uses uh, netlinking, et cetera, to move these SRIV virtual functions into specific pod namespaces. So depending on the uh, namespace in which you're creating a VM, it will allocate, um, it will run the netlink command and move over any virtual function or physical function into the respective namespace. Um, lastly, Maltus. So Maltus is more like a meta plugin. Uh, so when you create a network attachment definition in KubeWord or in Kubernetes, you can basically use Maltus with the SRIV CNI plugin whenever you attach a VMI to a SRIV interface. So this is something that's part of the network attachment definition CRD object that, that I'll show shortly. And what it basically helps with is um, it identifies the object annotations and based on the resource name that you configure when you uh, set up the device plugin and whatever reference you put in there, QWord is automatically able to fill that in in the uh, word launcher pod that is running a specific VM. And it would go ahead and update the requests and limit section for those pods there. Uh, so by, by using Maltus in combination with the SRIV device plugin, uh, the resource name annotation is, is something that the pod will receive a device from the pool uh, that is allocated by the device plugin. And this allows any, uh, this allows us to basically avoid any manual intervention and passing in the required PCI address. So this kind of simplifies the process a whole lot. Uh, in terms of any configuration on the SRIV host rate, uh, the cluster host that, host that you want to use for uh, SRIV VNFs, um, you basically need a NIC card that is SRIV capable. So not all hardware is capable of supporting SRIV by default. Uh, once you have that, uh, there are also certain BIOS settings that you need to enable to uh, actually utilize that NIC function. And uh, on some of the physical servers, you would see a setting in BIOS that's there's a global enable flag for SRIV that needs to be enabled. And there's also a per next setting that you can toggle and enable it for specific NICs. Uh, once it's enabled in the BIOS, uh, you also need to enable IOMMU support in the kernel level. Uh, so in the kernel command line, you can pass in the below flags. Uh, so if it's Intel processor, then you would pass Intel IOMMU equal to on. If it's uh, AMD, you would do AMD underscore IOMMU. And uh, similarly, you would also add these PCI equal to reallocate and PCI equal to assign buses command line parameters to the kernel config. Uh, if you do make that change in the grab command line, uh, then you need to kind of save that and rebuild the RAM disk and reboot your host in that case. If this is the first time that you're setting up the host for uh, you know, SRIV cluster. Uh, like I mentioned before, for KubeWord, it only supports the VFIO user space driver to pass through these PCI devices into QMU for running your VMs. Uh, so you need to load the kernel module VFIO PCI for your VMs to consume it. Uh, in terms of how do you actually create a VMI in KubeWord using SRIV, uh, this is how the spec word kind of look like. Uh, so in, in the interfaces section for a given VM, uh, by, by default, you would always have the pod network for the Kubernetes listed as the first interface. 
uh, and there are like two modes that you can put that in. So the default network here is put in the masquerade mode. I'll, I'll not get into the details of that here. Uh, and uh, the second interface is attached to SRIV network. Uh, these SRIV net, as you can see uh, on the right side, it specifies that the network type for this is Multis. And you can specify the network name here, which corresponds to a network attachment definition. So this is how a network attachment definition for SRIV would look like. Uh, what I was referring to earlier is the, sorry, is the resource name that you specify as the annotation in metadata section. And here, this, this is a custom uh, prefix that you can have. Um, in, in this case, I have it set to intel.com slash intel underscore SRIV, uh, which means the Kubernetes scheduler will look for any nodes uh, that have resources of this annotation and accordingly schedule parts or VMs on, on such a node. Uh, in terms of the spec uh, of this network attachment definition, uh, you will see that it has the type as SRIOV with a specific CNI version. Uh, you can have uh, optionally a VLAN ID added here, but, but that's something that you can um, choose to not have if it's a flat network. Uh, the IPAM section, the example I have here, it's using whereabouts plugin for IPAM. Uh, in which case you would specify a, a range of IPs, uh, a subnet along with a, a allocation range, uh, start and end. And you can also specify gateway. Um, the IPAM section is not really specific to SRIOV. So the only two distinctive uh, things here would be the type field and the CNI version that would apply. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll cover the demo for SRIV at the end together with OBS TPDK. So before that, I'll just uh, talk briefly about uh, what this technology means. Uh, so the first uh, thing just to uh, kind of talk about Open vSwitch, uh, what it really is, it's a production quality multi-layer virtual switch. And in terms of the main components of Open vSwitch, uh, we have uh, the forwarding path and the vSwitch D. Uh, so forwarding path here is uh, basically your data plane uh, network forwarding path and uh, the module is implemented in kernel space to achieve uh, higher performance. And the second one, vSwitch D is the user space component of it. This is the one that actually does uh, traffic switching. So if you have uh, OVS bridge created on a hypervisor that's running multiple VMs, it would basically switch packets from one port to another, depending on uh, what's the source and destination of each packet. Uh, so, so this basically you'll see that there are components in both kernel space and user space, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that really matters when we talk about DPDK. Uh, so uh, what is DPDK? Uh, it's, it, DPDK stands for Data Plane Development Kit. Um, the goal of uh, DPDK environments is basically to allow you to do faster packet processing uh, for any telco apps that require a higher throughput. Uh, similar to SRIV here, uh, it, it tries to achieve that by bypassing the kernel, uh, Linux kernel network stack. Uh, for implementing uh, switching in the user space, it, it relies on goal mode drivers. And uh, DPDK is also something that you can combine with Open vSwitch. So when you have Open vSwitch on a host and you combine that with DPDK, you get accelerated performance uh, because it's bypassing user space in, in, in both the layers. In terms of comparison of uh, network throughput with DPDK and SRIV, uh, if you, uh, Intel had conducted a study where it tried to compare the performance in both the cases. And um, what it basically concluded was that if you have east-west traffic between VNF apps that are running in the same server, in that case, uh, DPDK would be a better alternative than going ahead with SRLV, which is more desirable if you have uh, north-south traffic that kind of exits the neck, in which case you can actually take advantage of uh, virtual functions. 
uh, having said that, you can also use both of them in combination. So you can have uh, obvious TPDK with that. Uh, so, so this diagram kind of uh, shows very well how, how you would uh, use a bone mode driver when in OBS with a DPDK case. Uh, so on the left-hand side, it shows um, the forwarding plane, which is running as a kernel space module. And in user space, you have the uh, switch ID. Uh, here, what you basically lose out on is any interrupts that happen in the kernel space add to uh, kind of make up uh, cause a bottleneck there uh, whereas on the right hand side uh, the user space module has a component has a dpdk forwarding module which uh, like i mentioned before it's relying on the pole mode drivers to do the packet switching uh, in in each of the case you'll see that the vnet uh, that's associated with every vnf will kind of go through OVS, uh, but it will do the packet processing or the forwarding in the user space instead of doing that in the uh, kernel module that was used for forwarding path earlier. Uh, so Qford support for DPDK uh, is it's still kind of pending. Uh, I, I've linked here the GitHub PR that was trying to add support for DPDK. Uh, this is still not fully merged uh, upstream. Um, so the demo that we do will be based off these changes and uh, we have uh, kind of implemented that on top of the upstream Qbert version, the latest one that we have. Um, the main components that you would need for uh, implementing any DPDK apps with Qbert, uh, the Intel user space CNI plugin, uh, again, you would use the Multis Meta plugin to uh, attach interfaces to our QVert VMs. And uh, in terms of uh, the packages that you need on the host, you would need OVS that's specifically built with DPDK support. Uh, so these are the host configuration steps that you would need to perform on the host. Um, Firstly, install the appropriate DPDK and OBS packages on host use based on whatever distribution you're using. Um, the OBS DPDK package is part of the over repo, so you can install it from there. Um, you would uh, typically need to configure uh, some number of huge pages based on your uh, physical hardware capacity. Uh, so you can configure that using the CTL and once it's persisted in that, um, you should be able to utilize huge pages in your VMI spec. Uh, for setting up DPDK devices, you would be using the VFI or PCI driver. Uh, so initially uh, you may have DPDK devices that are getting managed by a different driver, but when you want to utilize it for uh, QVort, uh, you would basically set override for a given PCI address and set the driver name as VFIO PCI. Once the module is loaded and you have the OVS bridge and DPDK port setup done, uh, sorry, um, and DPDK configuration done, you would need to create uh, a DPDK port in OVS as well. Uh, for that, you can use the OVS VSCTL command line. Uh, I've just given here like one example where you first add a bridge uh, with data path type as net dev. Uh, so instead of using a uh, host net device, it's going to use net dev and uh, you add a DPDK port to that bridge for every physical DPDK device that you wanna associate with that bridge. And that can be specified using the DPDK dev args argument here. And you would specify the PCI address uh, that would match whatever was the ID that you passed in uh, the command above with driver CTL set override, where you attach it to VFIO PCI driver. Uh, uh, similar to the QFORT uh, VMI spec for SRIOV, uh, here, here you would uh, pass in the interface names and 
uh, sorry, the network name as uh, vhost user net one as an example, and the type would be vhost user for the second interface. Uh, the first interface is the same default pod network in this case. Um, the network name that you specify under multi section on the right is a net one here. And net one is what would be uh, matched with your network attachment definition name. So here is a sample of the network attachment definition for DPDK. Uh, in this case, uh, contrast in contrast to the earlier YAML file that we looked at, uh, the type here would be user space. Uh, again, you specify a CNI version, and then there's this uh, host and container section that you need to specify. Uh, under the host um, dictionary, you have uh, the engine type as OVS TPDK. Uh, the interface type here is vhost user. Uh, so typically with OVS TPDK, you can either have the interface type as vhost user or vhost user client. And uh, that's the one that we have specified here. Uh, so vhost mode is client in this case. and what the bridge name that we added with OVS VSCTL add bridge, that's the one that you would specify under the bridge name section. Uh, again, under the on the container side, you would specify uh, interface type as vhost user, and this is the server side of it. Um, so what, what it really means is um, you create a DPDK port on the host, which will be a client, and inside the container where you're running a VM and uh, using QMU and attaching the port as an interface to that VM, uh, that is going to act as a server. So those are the two different modes where uh, either host is acting as a client, uh, in which case it's vhost user, and the other one is where container can act as a client, uh, or rather QMU can act as a client. Uh, and all it really uh, means is that you are, one of them is responsible for creating the socket and the other one is going to try and establish a connection to that socket. Uh, so after this, we'll cover the demo side of uh, QVirt and uh, see how we can deploy VNF apps using SRIV and DPDK both. Uh, so let's get into the demo uh, uh, for running VNF applications using QVirt VMs. Uh, I'll first cover uh, SRLV interfaces attached to VMs and show how you can create a VM um, using QPort and, and then move on to um, creating a VNF using a VM, a VM that has DPDK interfaces. Uh, so for SRLV, I already have a cluster created here. Uh, it's a single node cluster. Uh, so the master node is also running workloads. Uh, I'll show the pods that run as part of QVirt since I have that installed here already. Uh, so for the cluster, you'll see the Word API, Word controller, and Word operator pods running. And for every host, there is a Word handler pod that runs. Since I just have one node in the cluster, there's a single Word handler pod that's running here. And it's uh, responsible for launching any VMs that get scheduled on that specific cluster node. Uh, I also have CDI, uh, which is uh, for uh, basically creating data volumes and associating those with those as um, disks for your VMs. Uh, since that is already running, uh, you would see CDI pods um, for API server deployment operator and upload proxy running here. Um, in terms of uh, the other component that we have here, uh, I have uh, Luigi, which is the open source plugin for configuring SRIOV. Uh, so in that Luigi namespace, you'll see a controller manager pod running here. So this pod is something that will monitor any network plugins that you create. And if you create a network template with SRIOV, it will help you create virtual functions in an automated way without really having to do any manual intervention there. So on this host, I have uh, created uh, virtual functions before. So if you look at 
an interface and under the sys class net uh, interface name device, there is a file called srlvnumvx, which will show you how many VFs have been created on this uh, interface. Uh, here, since I'm using Luigi, uh, I'll also show the YAML file that you would create for uh, configuring your device plugin uh, that we spoke about in the, in, in the CNI section. Uh, the resource list here is what specifies a, sp a resource prefix and a resource name. Uh, this is what we would need to use later on in the network attachment definition spec file, uh, resource prefix in combination with the resource name. Uh, to kind of uh, decide which interfaces you want to be uh, enabled with the SRAV device plugin. Uh, there are different formats in which you can specify the selector section. Uh, the one I have used here is uh, just uh, straightforward physical function names. Uh, I have two NICs here that are capable of uh, uh, SRAV, uh, ENO3 and ENO4. And uh, Luigi would basically, mm -hmm help configure them with the VFI or PCI driver. So that's the driver I'm, I'm specifying here in the config map that's used by a device plugin. Uh, once that is done, uh, so this is the actual host network template that can be applied using Luigi. Uh, what it looks at in terms of the nodes that it can run this template on, or rather configure this template on, uh, you have the node selector. So any node in that cluster which has network SRLV capable set to true, it would configure SRLV on that, uh, on, only on those selected nodes. Um, for each uh, physical function, uh, you can specify the number of VFs, the VF driver to bind using, and the MTU size if you want to set that. So this is a sample uh, template using which I had created virtual functions. And that's why you see seven VFs that are present on this host. After that, that is created, you would basically apply the network attachment definition file and I'll show the contents of that. Uh, so the network attachment, uh, network attachment name here is SRIV network ENO which would be part of your VMI spec file. Uh, the thing to note here is basically the type SRIRV line. And optionally, you can set a VLAN ID. And uh, for IPAM, you could use whereabouts or any other plugin as, as desired. So I'm gonna create a VM here. This is the VMI spec file. In the VMI spec, you, it's similar to how you would create a typical uh, virtual machine instance uh, object uh, in Q4. Uh, I'll focus on the parts that are specific to SRIV here, uh, which is basically your network interfaces section in the domain spec. Um, the first network being the pod network and the second one being the SRIV type and the network section here. Uh, which specifies the multis network name. And this is what matches your network attachment definition that we looked at earlier. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm just using a Fedora test image here. Uh, so this, is, this image is something that you can replace with your specific VNF application and uh, put any associated CloudNet script as part of uh, the CloudNet uh, data here. So let's go ahead and create that VM. So VMI SRIV2 was already running uh, on this uh, cluster and VMI SRIV1 is the new VM that I just created. So let's give it a minute to start up and, and we can go ahead and connect to this IP address and see that we are able to reach the other, other VM there. So if we look at the network interfaces inside this VM, uh, 
uh, you'll notice ETH0 that's attached to the default pod network. And then there is ETH1, uh, which is your SRIV interface in this case. And uh, here, this is again the IP of the VM that was already running, but this is on the default pod network. Um, with SRIV, it doesn't really get an IP assigned to inside the VM. So you would need to configure that via a cloud in its script. Uh, the IP that was associated using whereabouts will just get assigned to the pod itself, but not to the actual VM that's running. Uh, so that's something that needs to be done either using an external DHCP server or using the CloudNet script here. Uh, so that's basically how you would create a, a VMI using SRLV. It's, it's really straightforward. The, the only thing that changes here is how you create uh, this network attachment definition. And once you have that, uh, you basically just need to use the, utilize the network name in your VMI spec. That's the only difference. Um, moving on to DPDK. So again, I have a pre-created cluster here. Let me just export the cube config and you'll see again that there's a single master node uh, that's available here. Uh, it, it again has the exact same uh, deployments here. Uh, there is kubeword installed and CDI installed. Uh, this also has, um, so, so since Luigi doesn't support DPDK today, that's still a, a some work in progress item for uh, adding to Luigi. Uh, I'll just showcase the OVS level info in this case. Uh, so if you look at the OVS VSCTL show output, you will see that there is an OVS bridge that's created. Uh, the OVS bridge created here has two interfaces, uh, has two ports, basically ENO2 and ENO4. Again, these are two NIC cards that are being utilized for DPDK traffic. In terms of configuring or adding the port, uh, the option that's utilized is DPDK dev args to which you assign the PCI address. So since I'm utilizing the entire um, ENO2 and ENO4 interfaces here as DPDK ports, I'm specifying their respective PCI addresses as part of the port config. So these are the two ports and you can also use uh, OVS in a bonded mode if, if that's what you desire. Uh, or you can add the ports directly here. So after the obvious bridge and port configuration is done, uh, I'll, I'll show the network attachment definition and how it differs from SRIOV. Uh, so we spoke about this earlier, uh, the host and container sections are the main ones that differ for the user space uh, type network attachment definition. Uh, the bridge name here, again, needs to match what you created in OVS. And uh, this host side should be in a client mode and container side would be in a server mode here. Uh, same thing, the IPAN section could be anything, uh, whereabouts is just an example here. Uh, the network name net1 is what would be part of the VMI spec. So you'll notice here, this is a virtual machine uh, named test DPDK. Uh, it has two interfaces, first one being the Kubernetes default pod network. And second one is an interface of type vhost new user. Uh, for this uh, DPDK network, you specify it using the Multis network name config and um, put it as net one here. Uh, again, I'm using a Fedora image, but this could be replaced with your DNF applications image and the corresponding cloud in script here. So we'll just go ahead and create a VM using this. Uh, so for the SRIV one, we are utilizing a VMI, uh, a virtual machine instance type. Okay, so once we have the VM running here, uh, we should be able to SSH into it. 
uh, inside the VM, I'm just running IPA command. And here again, you'll see uh, two interfaces. Uh, each zero is a default pod network. And uh, since it was using masquerade mode, uh, this will show you the internal IP address. Uh, that's snatted and uh, on the pod level that you would see the IP address that's shown up here. Uh, ETH1 is your actual DPDK interface. So when you run a VNF application here using ETH1 as the uh, tra uh, interface for your data traffic, you should be able to get the performance benefits out of running the VNF with our DPD OBS based DPDK. Uh, so, so that's kind of the um, only change again on the DPDK side uh, there is some host level config that was needed, right? And uh, the only packages that you installed here would be uh, Open the Switch and DPDK. Uh, so I just want to quickly show the packages that you would need for DPDK on this host. Uh, since I had already configured it, uh, it's using the DPDK package itself, which is for the mm, runtime. and uh, even for Open V switch, it needs a package from the over repo because that's the one that's compiled with uh, DPDK enabled. Uh, so that's the only config that you would need here outside of what you configured with OVS VSCTL show. And uh, in a driver CTL, you would run the uh, command to basically set an override for the uh, VFI or PCI driver like we spoke about earlier. Uh, so, so that concludes the demo on uh, running VNF applications using Qbert uh, VMs with both SRLV and DPDK. Uh, thank you for listening.